The United Nations General Assembly voted on the latest resolution on Cuba against the US's embargo that has been choking the island nation for over six decades. The overwhelming vote left only the United States and Israel on the side of continuing the blockade. What does this vote tell us about the United States' rhetoric on human rights? As the US asks for humanitarian pauses to Israel's war on Gaza, the death toll in the Strip has crossed 9,000. Hospitals are overoccupied, strung out and short on even the most basic of requirements as well as, of course, on fuel. Our uh, hospitals are now on the verge of complete shutdown. What are medical uh, workers in Gaza facing on a daily basis as of today? And Australia and China will mark 50 years of formal, uh, formal diplomatic ties with a visit to Beijing by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Does the visit underline the unique relationship between the two nations? Salam, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you as always from the People's Dispatch uh, studios here in New Delhi. I'm Sidhan Dani. Uh, before we go any further, take a second and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our lead story today in the context of the ongoing Israeli offensive against Gaza, the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly, as it does every year, on a resolution against the US blockade on Cuba, an over 60-year policy that uh, Washington has maintained despite the rest of the world condemning. This, uh, the policy, of course, has a massive impact on the economic lives and freedoms of the people of Cuba, as well as, of course, Cuban nationals who live outside the country. Israel was the only other nation to support the United States, while Ukraine abstained from voting. And Natalia Marquez has the details and joins us now. The United Nations General Assembly just voted almost unanimously to end the cruel and illegal 60 plus year long US blockade against Cuba. Um, the only states to vote against this resolution are the United States, of course, which enforces this blockade and Israel. The only state to abstain is Ukraine. Of course, in the backdrop right now is Israel's genocide against the Gaza Strip and its ongoing occupation of Palestine. Um, the United States funds Israel to the tune of $4 billion each year and is about to pass a massive spending package funding Israel with an additional $14 billion in the wake of this genocide that's happening right now against the Palestinian people. Um, Ukraine, also a country that receives billions of dollars in U.S. funding every single year, ever since um, the beginning of the conflict with Russia in February of 2022. Um, so these three states being the only countries not voting in favor of this resolution is no, co is no coincidence, right? Um, 187 nations voted in favor. Every single year, Cuba presents this resolution to end the blockade, which has caused fuel shortages, food shortages, medicine shortages, um, you know, inhibits the, um, you know, humanitarian financial aid into the island, um, inhibits trade, um, you know, really causes a lot of financial economic strain on the Cuban people who are not able to access many of the same resources as people in the United States. You know, Cubans can't even use um, things that we take for granted, such as Zoom um, in the rest of the world. Um, so this is something that Cuba has been trying to eliminate um, ever since um, essentially uh, the revolution. Um, you know, this blockade was put in place um, only shortly after 1959, um, the triumph of the, re of the revolution in Cuba. Um, the representative of Gabon said today during the UN General Assembly debate, the scale of its impact is more and more harmful to the Cuban people and that it's clearly a hostile act to region and continental cohesion. Um, every single year, the Cubans introduce this resolution. Every single year, it passes overwhelmingly. 
And every single year, the United States chooses to once again ignore it and continue um, to illegally blockade the island despite the opposition of the rest of the world. However, with the additional backdrop of Palestine um, and the growing unpopularity of uh, US imperialist policies throughout the entire world and even in the United States itself uh, by its own people, um, the United States is becoming increasingly isolated um, by the rest of the world in its um, pursuit of violent sanctions and blockades of any country that doesn't follow its agenda. Um, Venezuela, um, a country that has been sanctioned by the United States for many years for having a similar revolutionary process to Cuba, um, called out the United States for being an isolated state um, in the UN General Assembly debate around this resolution. Um, there are as of now going to be massive protests um, to free Palestine in the United States in direct opposition to US policy and funding of Israel. There is a massive wave of discontent with the billions of dollars going to Ukraine. Um, so there is an increasing isolation of US imperialist policies on the world stage and in the US itself. Gaza City today is being described by reporters on the ground as a ghost town, surrounded by Israeli forces and facing relentless aerial bombardment. The United States and Israel's rhetoric on war and human rights, meanwhile, continues, as Natalia was just pointing out in the context uh, of Cuba, of course. Uh, 9,000 Palestinians have been confirmed killed so far, according to the Ministry of Health. This is since October 7th and in Gaza alone. Uh, reports from uh, the likes of Al Jazeera also point out uh, that there's been a marked rise in attacks on Palestinians by settlers in other parts of the occupied territories as well. These are now almost a daily occurrence. Thousands of workers who were uh, from Gaza who were employed in Israel have now been forced back by authorities into the enclave. The siege has led to essential supplies almost completely out. Uh, nowhere near enough is coming in in terms of aid. Anna Brachar has been reporting consistently on the medical and health conditions uh, that, uh, that we are seeing on the ground and uh, joins us now. Um, Anna, we are hearing uh, that uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Israel uh, and is pushing apparently leaders for uh, humanitarian pauses uh, in the conflict. Uh, just taking that as a little bit of a peg, uh, tell us... Uh, or update us on the situation uh, from a health medical perspective uh, that Gazans are facing at the moment. I know you're going to talk a bit specifically about particular hospitals, uh, but, but first, a uh, general sort of update on the scenario at present. Well, uh, as the U.S. is calling for the so-called humanitarian pauses, uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Health has already warned that there are about uh, 1,200 children still trapped under the debris. Uh, we have several, uh, so we have over 100 paramedics killed during the conflict until now, and we have several dozens of ambulances which are uh, out of order as of today. So, of course, you know, this whole thing combines with the fact that there still isn't enough aid coming into Gaza, uh, especially fuel, which is so necessary to, uh, to run the generators of the hospitals uh, that are already struggling with, uh, uh, with a extremely large number of patients uh, and also uh, with the very high numbers of people who are seeking refuge in the hospitals. Um, in addition to all that, uh, many of the hospitals, especially those in northern Gaza, are also reporting that they're experiencing shelling in their proximity uh, and that's very close. So some, some hospitals uh, are putting the shelling, the, the bombs falling down uh, as close as to 100 or 50 meters from from the hospital themselves. So mm. you can imagine how, how that can uh, impact uh, everyday, everyday work. Uh, it's causing tremors, it's causing uh, bursts of dust. Uh, it's causing, of course, extreme anxiety and stress among the patients and among the people who are there. Uh, so essentially it's not really uh, the, it, it's, it's no, uh, no context for uh, providing proper healthcare right now. 
and then, of course, you know, if uh, if we look in addition to that, uh, what's ha what has been happening over the last couple of days, if people had been sheltering in the hospital grounds before, they are now moving into the hospitals. So that means that, you know, in, in addition to having tens of thousands of people, literally, some, some hospitals are now sheltering uh, between 10,000 and 50,000 people, not patients, people who are just displaced and have nowhere else to go. Mm they're now moving into the hospitals because uh you know there there just isn't enough room and also outside it's not it's not safe uh it's not safe anymore yeah um of course uh in addition to uh, to the people who are not hurt but they are seeking uh, shelter in the hospitals we also have skyrocketing uh, occupancy rates uh, in hospitals and i think that skyrocketing doesn't even <laughs> begin to cover it here um, because if uh, if we look at some of the biggest hospitals in Gaza, uh, like Al Shifa, uh, it usually has the capacity for around 700 patients. Uh, it's now at several thousand. So you know, it's uh, it, it's not even something that we can compare to uh, any kind of normal times. Yeah. Um, also, a couple of days ago. Um, we have heard reports that uh, uh, a couple of dozens of patients uh, have been let through the Rafah uh, border into Egypt. So that's uh, the, the, uh, the that's <laughs> uh, you know you remember how they talked about the aid coming in is not even a drop in the ocean yeah. compared to the need that there are there on the ground. So essentially, the number of the patients who are leaving Gaza to receive proper care is not a drop in the ocean of what uh, of what the people actually need. Uh, some of the data coming out from the Palestinian Ministry of Health puts the number of uh, of uh, injured people at over 20,000. So, you know, uh, having 100 people leaving to Egypt uh, it, that does not even begin to cover it. And then on top of all that, and that's just, you know, a final point for this kind of uh, overview, is mm -hmm. that, uh, of course, we're talking about the hospitals, and we should because it's such a central point of, uh, of health care. Uh, but the WHO office for the occupied Palestinian territories has warned that uh, not only hospitals, but are also primary services have been affected. And then less than one third of the primary serv services that are needed, needed are currently operating. Uh, so, you know, as people try to move south, if they try to move south, they're, they're not facing a much better, uh, a much better situation. They are facing... Uh, an extremely limited amount of health services that they can access even before October 7. Uh, if we talk about dialysis uh, only, only 20% of the dialysis capacity in Gaza were located southern uh, of what the Israeli occupying forces uh, have uh, have targeted like uh, with, uh, with the evacuation orders. So, you know, even if the hospitals were able to move the patients, uh, they would not be able to access the the healthcare that they so so much need. Um, and of course, those who are also working uh, Anna, in uh, providing uh, whatever semblance of healthcare they can, uh, uh, no doubt. Uh, I mean, going above and beyond uh, in terms of executing uh, the jobs that they have to do. Uh, they're also very much a part of it. Their homes uh, often part of the, the areas that are targeted. Extreme difficulties and, and as part of your reportage, you've been uh, looking specifically at, uh, for example, the Indonesian hospital, the Turkish-Palestinian, uh, as well as Al-Shifa that you mentioned uh, earlier. Tell us a little bit more about these specific cases as, uh, you know, those large hubs providing uh, health care to large numbers of people and now also, like you were saying, uh, operating as makeshift camps, uh, shelters? So essentially what you've said is very important. I think that you know the health workers that are there are continuing in spite of uh, receiving daily or even hourly reports that their uh, their families have been murdered in attacks, they, that they have died because of the bombardment th themselves. Mm. And then in addition to that, uh, you know, um, as days goes by, um, we are uh, approaching the scenario that they have been warning all along about, and that's you know when the fuel runs out, it, it the hospital is not is not able to operate anymore. So many of the hospitals have already stopped their operations because of uh, because of lack of fuel because of the of the attacks. Mm. Uh, we do know that the Indonesian hospital, which is also one of the largest in Gaza. 
uh, is already operating on backup generators. So that means that, you know, everything except for the extreme basics uh, right. have been shut yeah. ha have been shut down. So that means uh, limitations on oxygen stations, on ventilation, on air conditioning, but also on work fridges. So it's not, you know, it's something that's uh, something that has very, very, uh, very real effects on the people who are currently there. Uh, then, of course, we also have to talk about the, the babies who are in the incubators and uh, yeah. who could die if uh, the po power goes out. Uh, and again, as uh, as uh, health workers have been warning over, over again, that fuel is running out and it's not getting into northern Gaza. Um, one more example of uh, of, a, of a very disturbing uh, a very disturbing example of what has happened is that the only hospital uh, which provides oncological care, the, Tur the Turkish Palestinian uh, Friendship Hospital, uh, was forced to shut down. That means no oncological care. Uh, mm -hmm. This has also been uh, warned about by the WHO uh, Director General. Uh, who who urged and plead for uh, for action to be taken on uh, on this account. There have been some reports uh, which indicate that Turkey m might take the patients uh, if they're allowed to cross the border. But again, as we have seen over the past weeks, this is not something that happens overnight. Uh, so it's thousands, it's hundreds of people whose lives are currently in danger because this this very essential hospital has um, has been forced to shut down. And then, of course, con to conclude with uh, Al Shifa, which uh, as the largest hospital. Uh, is the one sheltering uh, 50,000 people. So 50,000 mm. people currently and repeatedly under evacuation orders because apparently Israeli authorities are saying that uh, they might be hosting uh, under uh, underground tunnels, uh, which in their interpretation would make it fair game for, uh, for an attack. Uh, but then on the other hand, you know, um, we are talking about such a large number of people, most of whom even, even in the case if they were able to move them all, and if they all, all the people wanted to go, uh, they have essentially no safe place to go. As again, we have heard over and over again. Uh, Al Jazeera reports, uh, recent reports indicate that those who even try to follow the evacuation order now and to leave northern Gaza to go to the south are being stopped, are being targeted by the Israeli occupying forces. Uh, and it's essentially not uh, not a feasible thing to do to move such a large number of critical patients yeah. anywhere, especially if you if you know that there are no capacities in terms of uh, of healthcare, but also in terms of supplies when you go south. And um, roads and things like that as well, of course, are targeted. So uh, movement uh, severely severely impaired. Uh, all right, Anand, thank you very much uh, for for that grim update. Uh, on the situation in Gaza, and, and we're still uh, talking about humanitarian pauses, uh, it seems, but we'll leave it there for today. Right, and finally, our last bit for today, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is visiting China on Saturday, the first Australian Prime Minister in seven years to make a state visit to its biggest trading partner by some way. The trip is also 50 years since the first such diplomatic visit by Gough Whitlam who was then Prime Minister of Australia, of course, uh, establishing formal relations between the two states. And while Albanese and Chinese President Xi Jinping have met previously at forums such as the G20, the visit is significant in the context of the recent thaw in the Australia-China equation. Anish covers the region for People's Dispatch and, of course, reports regularly on Daily Debrief uh, on ties between the two. He's with us now via video conference. Anish, good to have you on the show. Um, I suppose... It, it's an obvious indication that uh, th there is a, a, an attempt to rebuild what was a, a troubled relationship for some time, uh, Anish. Yes, definitely. because uh, it, And it has been happening uh, for nearly a year now. Uh, one of the things that pretty much marked uh, uh, you know, the current Albanese government and set it apart from the previous Scott Morrison government is that it has been more or less practical, even though it has to pay uh, some lip service and also has to make some statements uh, in alliance with, uh, you know, some of the liberals at home, some of the war mm. at home. It has, mm. to, it still is far more, uh, you know, practical in substance uh, when, and also when it comes to actually taking action. And so it understands the fact that you cannot supplant or replace 
uh, China with anybody else because at this point in time, it is almost irreversible. Uh, China is its biggest trading partner. Nearly a third of uh, Australia's foreign trade volume comes from uh, is with China alone. And there is obviously this whole, um, you know, the gravity model of uh, uh, trade that are, also works in its favor. And China is its closest massive uh, market that it can actually have access to. And so losing that would be a big, big problem for Australia. And it will affect across uh, sectors and industries uh, from agriculture, from, uh, you know, animal husbandry to even uh, mining and all sorts of things that actually Australia does supply China with, and which China can actually find uh, replacements with, but Australia mm-hmm. cannot find the market uh, that, to replace uh, China with. And so that kind of uh, sets it apart. And this relations, this attempt at thawing these relations, and also uh, you know the statements made by uh, the prime minister where he says that he will try to anchor trade as the uh, you know the way forward for uh, china australia relations also shows that there is a practical side to his foreign policy at the moment uh, is it also anish there is a large number of uh, people of chinese origin who live in australia is it also a uh, constituency domestically uh, for the Labour Party and Anthony Albanese to, to sort of consider as, uh, as a factor in their foreign policy? Um, it's, I, I'm not sure how big that, th- uh, those considerations would be. Obviously, there is a significant Chinese community diaspora uh, within Australia. Uh, but, you know, diasporic Chinese have different kind of uh, political affiliations. Agenda. Many of them are uh, not very uh, keen with any kind of good relations with uh, China or, you know, what they see as communist China. Some uh, look, look at it as the homeland that they fire might uh, have some level of loyalty to. Uh, there is definitely uh, uh, some level of welcome to this uh, move and this attempt to thaw relations primarily because it actually takes away the heat from them because obviously anti-Asian uh, or anti-Chinese uh, racism uh, actually grew during uh, this whole trade war business. And that has actually affected uh, a lot of people of Chinese origins, uh, even uh, including most of, including many Australian citizens. So that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it is something that is missed, but they are, I do not think that they are the most significant factor. I primarily believe that uh, there is a certain level of economic uh, and in, uh, you know trade interest that actually yeah. is driving this move forward. Because well, let's also face the fact that even the capitalists within Australia, domestic mm. capitalists, do not want any kind of bad relations with China because they do depend a large part of their trade, of their business with China and, and the market that uh, it affords uh, these companies. So definitely they do not want to jeopardize that as well. And that also affects, and that pretty much is the reason why this uh, entire thing is happening right now. Nevertheless, we have to wait and see how far this can actually go uh, if uh, there is some kind of level of commitment. Uh, But nevertheless, as I told you, it is irreversible, the kind of trade volume and the kind of relations that these two countries have had. There might be damages that have been done, but it is not possible. And in fact, completely impossible for them to, replace the other uh, that easily. All right. We'll uh, wait and see that that uh, visit is still upcoming. So if there are any major breakthroughs, uh, Anish will, of course, uh, report on those. That's all we have on the show today from Anish, myself, and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, as always, you can head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work that we're doing. Uh, also, don't forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.